Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the uh, LPC board, I'd like to welcome you as well to our second annual forum. Uh, so, of course, as you know, a year ago, the LPC was wrapping up its two-year seed-funded project phase. But since then, we have uh, enacted uh, bylaws, become a membership organization with 62 members and growing, and elected a board to oversee this consortium of academic libraries. Of course, we're still working through this transition a little bit. Uh, so for example, this year we will not hold a board election in order to get on schedule with the staggered terms of the board members specified in the bylaws. But we've also lost no time in uh, moving the organization forward, most notably by proposing amendments to the bylaws a few months ago, uh, which were approved by our members last month. And among the most notable changes will be allowing members from outside the US and Canada, in case you missed this. Um, and I'm pleased to report that the membership committee has already begun receiving applications from newly eligible members. who will be eligible as of uh, July 1st. Uh, and there is, in fact, quite a bit of activity outside of North America in library publishing that we should be sure to stay aware of. Uh, so Sarah and I, uh, for example, recently attended a symposium in Australia called Reinventing University Publishing. It was sponsored by the Council of Australian University Librarians. Uh, so we had a captive audience of the, the deans of libraries of Australian universities. Uh, and we promoted the library publishing models that we see in North America and uh, heard what, what the Australian uh, institutions have been doing in this area. They've really been a leader in relaunching uh, defunct university press brands as open access publishing efforts under the library. And we're seeing this start to happen in the UK as well. Uh, some of these um, relaunch presses uh, publish only the work of scholars at their home institution, um, which of course is also a common model for university presses in continental Europe. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and of course, it's often been said, as you may have heard, that this is how university presses began in the Anglo-American world as well. Um, but we shouldn't also forget uh, CLO and, and, and Open Edition, two publicly funded open access scholarly publishing efforts based in Brazil and France, respectively, both of which host content from many small institutional publishers and are rapidly institutionalizing. There's just really a lot, a lot, of, a lot of things out there that we, uh, I think as we internationalize here, we'll become better connected to. So uh, but first, before I uh, introduce our first keynote speaker, um, let me make a quick plug for a recent uh, Inside Higher Ed column by Barbara Pfister. I hope you all might have seen it a, a week or two ago. I think it actually makes the best case to our fellow library colleagues for why academic libraries should be involved in publishing. Uh, it's called uh, Libraries Beyond Borders, Rethinking Community. Maybe somebody can, can tweet that link if you haven't seen it already. Um, do take a moment to read it or reread it um, and keep in mind her talking points uh, for the next time you encounter skepticism about the work we're doing. Uh, I also want to take a quick moment to thank the members of the program committee for putting together such a, such a great program here, uh, especially Melanie Schlosser for stepping in as chair halfway through the planning. Uh, I hope you're looking forward to the program as, as much as I am. So now uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Martin Paul Eve, our first speaker. He is a currently lecturer in English at the University of Lincoln in the UK. And besides his academic career focusing on contemporary American fiction, he is well known for his work on open access, uh, among other things appearing before a House of Commons committee and serving on steering groups tied to OAPEN UK, JISC, SCONAL, the Open Knowledge Foundation, and HEFKE. He's also the author of Open Access and the Humanities, Context, Controversies, and the Future, uh, which was published um, just last year by Cambridge University Press, and it's available to read online for free. So it uh, practices what it preaches. Um, and he is per perhaps the best known, though, as co-founder of the Open Library of Humanities, which he's going to tell us a bit about today. So please join me in welcoming Martin Pauli. Okay, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I tell my friends I'm going to a library conference and speaking, and they all think I'm a total geek. But it, as far as I'm concerned, this is the closest to being a rock star that it gets. Um, <clears throat> so it's great to be here. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about a specific challenge of open access in relation to library publishing enterprises. I'm not going to talk about textbooks um, with a completely different economic model underpinning them. I'm going to focus mainly on serials and journals. And when I get on to talk about library publishing, the effort that I'm going to bring to the fore is concerned with the problems of institutional cooperation in an environment where universities are forced to compete. 
And I'm going to give some examples from the UK of how this is coming to the fore with respect to university presses, library publishing, how they're differentiated, and what cooperation actually looks like, even when there's goodwill uh, within institutions. So I hope that is of interest to you today. If it isn't, I'm sure there are some great bars around Portland that open at this time of day anyway. I'm going to start with some absolute basics, and I suspect that many of you are well familiar with this, so I won't go on too long. But I want to make sure we're on the same page about what we mean when we talk about open access. We're talking about peer-reviewed research that is free to read and reuse online with some caveats. When we talk about gold open access, we're talking about the publisher themselves doing open access. We're not talking about any one specific business model to support that. And that's really important when we talk about the humanities, because there's been a lot of misunderstanding. In fact, perhaps the fact that gold so easily equates with finance and money means that most humanities authors associate gold explicitly with the article processing charge model. I'll talk about why that's a problem later. The fact is, though, that most library publishing enterprises, when they've come to the fore in recent years, have gone open access by default. It's simply the thing you do in the age of digital dissemination if you want the broadest reach for the material you're publishing. Libraries often don't think twice about open access. Without a model to support it, though, that is not simply one library paying all the costs, that can be tricky to sustain, and I want to talk about that later. The key point, though, is that actually the Directory of Open Access Journals shows us that the majority of gold open access journals today are not run on an article processing charge basis. Publishers come back and say, well, there's no model to sustain this. What does it look like? But it shows that there are people thinking about this, and the humanities uh, assertion often that gold article processing charges not for us doesn't have to be the way. Secondly, and the other area in which libraries are intimately involved in the open access chain is in respect to green open access. Green open access is when academics publish wheresoever they would like and then deposit a copy in an institutional repository. And that is really easy for funders to mandate, for institutions to ask their researchers to do. Because at the moment, there's no evidence that green open access causes subscription cancellations for publishers. In fact, we found in the UK that 97% of journal articles published in 2014 could have been made green open access through an institutional repository. Researchers didn't deposit, of course, because nobody was making them do it. And it's not part of their socially accepted workflow but we could have done it, and in future, we're going to make them. So green open access is obviously the area where the library is most well known for most humanities researchers. They run that repository thing into which I'm being forced now to deposit my work. But also that is interesting as an amplifying aspect of publication. Uh, Michael Basker has recently defined publishing as a process of filtering, framing, and amplification. The availability of a green open access version, often through the library and the institutional repository, is surely a way of amplifying the original work, of bringing attention to it. And libraries, even when they don't define their programs as being about publishing, are contributing to that part of the process. Gold and green. We also, though, have another area of contention in the humanities, which is with respect to permissions. If anyone writes on the web, and presumably they do so because they want to be freely read, and they don't put an additional copyright statement on that work, then they retain the full rights to that publication, and no one can reuse it beyond the bounds of fair use or fair dealings. If, however, you openly license your work, we would call that Libra open access, and we give others in advance permission to reuse work beyond those enshrined in copyright statutes. In the humanities, this has caused an enormous degree of backlash for various reasons. Um, some of the uh, arguments are more specious than others, so plagiarism will be facilitated by open licensing is one that is frequently trotted out. I don't think that's the case. People plagiarize whether or not you've given them open licensing permissions. Bad guys don't, they're not obeying the rules anyway, that's why they're the bad guys. So we have institutional sanctions to deal with that. We haven't frequently used legal mechanisms to deal with it. Perhaps that's not such a great argument. But integrity of work. Um, the individual's labor of production in isolation seems to be the core concern around this. If we let people reuse work in an open access environment, how do we ensure accreditation when our systems within the university for value are so strongly tied to individuals producing research in the humanities? A bit of background to open access. 
The other problem in the humanities for open access is that the history looks as though it came almost exclusively from the sciences. I want to contend that's not quite true, but it nonetheless presents some uh, problems and some counter arguments often come back that, uh, where this is thrown in my face. So here's a history of open access. In 1989, Richard Stallman drafts a license called the GNU Public License for Programmers. Stallman is sometimes deemed a fanatic, oftentimes deemed a saint, but his fundamental contention is that in the contemporary age, many of our lives are controlled by computer systems to which we have no right of inspection or modification. If you think about the systems that determine whether or not you can get a mortgage, the systems that fine you automatically via speed cameras and radar guns, you have no way of verifying what the software within those systems is doing. And Stallman says that this is a societal problem as computers come to the fore in our everyday lives. However, Stallman says, programmers, apply my license to your work. This license says you must make the source code available. You must let others modify the work. And you must give that right to anyone else if you modify the work. And this is called a viral copyleft license. It's a radical way of thinking about copyright. Because Stallman says, I'm going to use my ownership of this intellectual property, he doesn't like that term, to say that others must behave in an open fashion. And around 2002, a Harvard-based lawyer, Larry Lessig, um, I know many of you will have seen him speak only the other day, comes up with the Creative Commons license idea. Lessig knows that great poets steal, that almost all work is derivative in some way or another. And in his book, Remix, he explicitly states, we are denying an entire generation of cultural producers the right to behave in a way that comes naturally to them with our current copyright provisions. He says, why don't we th take this thinking about open licensing and apply it to any form of cultural production? This would be a healthier climate. And around the time that Lessig is formulating these licenses for any form of cultural production, those in the academy are thinking about the model of research production and the economics that underpin it. In fact, the academy is really interesting in this respect. It is the last space where we have a model of patronage for employees. Um, you might be able to think of another one. I haven't yet, so I'm going to just assert it's the last space. But this is one where academics are paid a salary to produce research work that they can give away. What other industry does that? What other industry says to a programmer, produce work so you can give it away? Um, no, usually it's a work for hire. But this means that academics are uniquely placed to be able to give away their work under open provisions and open licensing. Academics are freed from the demands of market populism so that they can investigate niche esoteric research topics without having to worry about selling it. And this allows open access in the academy, theoretically. Of course, we have other entities, publishers, who are very much dependent on a market, and so we obviate many of the benefits of that system. But nonetheless, the idea at, and the theoretical concept works. From 2003 onwards, we see a proliferation of sub-institutional, institutional, and funder-level mandates for open access, many of which make no distinction between the sciences and the humanities, particularly when taxpayer money is involved. So goes the argument that if the public have paid for it, the public should get access. That's a great argument in many political circles. It's also one that comes sometimes with some political problems. Um, the figure of the taxpayer is often made out to be quite a mean figure, a figure who almost certainly wouldn't want to continue funding work in the humanities. So I think we need to be a little bit cautious there, but nonetheless, an interesting way in which openness is proliferated through politics. So the narrative I've traced there, almost entirely scientific. High energy physics is one of the best examples of this working. Computer science at Southampton was the first university in the world to have a sub-institutional mandate for green open access. But there is a presence of the humanities throughout this history. And it's also worth saying that science is not some monolithic block that you can just treat universally. Chemistry and medicine have poor rates of institutional deposit for green open access. The sciences are not just all doing this and the humanities not. But if we think about the formal history here, actually the Budapest Open Access Declaration was drafted by a philosopher of epistemology and ethics, Peter Suber. Jean-Claude Guédon, a professor of comparative literature at Montreal, was a signatory to these initial declarations. The humanities are underrepresented in the formal histories, but they are present. I think more importantly, though, is the fact that whenever humanists now go to publish in online spaces, they go to open access by default, whether they're working with library publishing partners 
or simply using PKP's excellent open journal system software to do it themselves. And obviously we have the great John Walensky speaking at the end of this event. So the raft of open access journals in the humanities show to me that it's not that open access is incommensurate with humanities research practice. It's merely that we haven't had the mass uptake yet, the tipping point in these disciplines to show that it can truly work across a range of disciplines for all scholars. And we need evidence to get there. We need experiments to try this. We need to make this clear. But why? Why do we need open access? Humanities research is often esoteric, difficult to understand, jargonistic. I'm really selling the disciplines here, as you can see. Um, do we need open access? Are there problems that this is a solution to? Well, there are three problems I contend that we need to address and that open access helps us with. I'm not going to advocate at any point, by the way, that openness is a generic panacea, silver bullet. Um, oftentimes, it comes along with other phenomena that are politically suspect in some cases for the university. Uh, online teaching provision that is given away for free doesn't seem to account for labor practices beneath that. But in specific contexts, I think open access gives us some answers. And these pertain to researcher access, public access, and reuse. The current way that we pay for the labor of publishing is not economically efficient, it's not a free market, and it doesn't serve libraries or researchers very well, is my contention. <clears throat> it looks a little bit like this. We have a system where researchers are paid by institutions to produce work that they then give to entities called publishers who perform various value-adding functions, typesetting, copy editing, proofreading, digital preservation, platform maintenance, persistent uh, identification assignment, etc., etc. Publishers then sell this material predominantly back to academic libraries, who are usually the sole customers for serials purchasing. Libraries are supposedly representing researchers in this process, but are also under unique budgetary constraints, of which researchers are usually unaware. In other words, the system acts to blind various entities from the constraints faced by the other. So researchers, for example, are not usually aware that the cost to each library of subscribing to all the material that every institution would need for its researchers and teachers has risen by 300% above inflation since 1986. They're also not usually aware of the cost implications of their choice to publish in specific venues. In fact, there's a great game you can play with your researcher constituents, which is when you're deciding which serials to cancel year on year, go to them and say, well, here's the budget, here are the serials you want, but we have to purchase all these because you published in them, here's what budget you have left. Um, it won't make you many friends, but it is quite interesting. At the same time though, and this is not generically the case, but uh, it's often true, libraries are unaware sometimes of the pressures that drive researcher behavior, and the fact that researchers operate on a symbolic economy of reputation. Researchers don't just publish in top journals because they think they're top journals and this will get them the broadest audience. They do so because there is a direct material return for them to do so. If you need to get tenure, to get hired, to get promoted, then you need to be published in top venues. And what's happening when we talk about top venues there is that the name of a publisher or the name of a journal brand is being used as a proxy measure for quality. And this comes about because of a labor shortage in the academy. If we have 350 applications per post, we can't possibly read 350 books every time that process goes on. So we need a shorthand. We need a way of saying, well, it was published with this press. We trust their quality control mechanisms. We'll use that as a way of quickly narrowing a shortlist down. But that comes with many problems because it ties us to existing publishers, existing models for publication. I'll talk about problems of transition shortly. So some publishers do very well as this system. Again, publishers, not a homo homogenous category. It's easy to pick holes in the sciences. Elsevier, with its 37% profit margin in 2012 across a multi-billion dollar revenue, uh, profit stream. But we see also this phenomenon emerging slowly in the humanities. Um, aggressive commercial publishers who acquire other publishers is an increasing problem where we have fewer and fewer entities controlling market share. Bloomsbury Academic, a humanities monograph publisher, bought Continuum 
which previously bought Berg, TNT, Clark, Cassell, Methuen Drama, Arden Shakespeare. And as a researcher on the ground, you just interact with your friendly editor. It still seems like a small press doing good things in your subject area, while actually they're often owned by larger entities for profit internationals. At the same time, in the journal space, Taylor and Francis and other commercial entities are making multi hundred million dollar profits off journal publishing entities that span the humanities as well. Uh, one last thing on this researchers obviously conduct peer review. If we're saying that we're using journal and publisher brand as a proxy for quality, there is labor in coordinating peer review, but fundamentally, what we really want from this system is a genealogy of validation. Who said what was good, and do we trust that? But the current system hides that and uses a proxy brand of a commercial entity oftentimes as the substitute for who said what was good. And that's the problem is, actually academics can submit wherever they like if they really wanted. They can review wherever they'd like. Often they are reviewing for different publications, but we still assign different value to that proxy. It doesn't correlate directly with quality or even with peer review control. Some economic problems. <clears throat> the public are denied access. Some people think that less of a problem for the reasons I outlined earlier. Often humanities research is fairly impenetrable. But we also have an increasingly educated populace who have been through the system of higher education, who have undertaken humanities degrees, who enjoyed their time while they were at the university. At the same time as this is going on, we're making arguments for the value of the humanities day on day to mitigate the rhetoric of crisis, which is counterbalanced against. And that argument for the defense of the humanities is often the liberal humanist one. We want educated subjects who think critically so that a democratic society can prosper. But if we think the humanities really contribute to that, how can it be true if Students come to us for a four-year degree, they have access to a wealth of information, and then we kick them out and that is discontinued. It strikes me that that's not likely to engender critical thinking in a broader society. It's likely to situate the humanities as a means for deferring employment and incurring debt, and that is the function. That's not what I want to see from the humanities, and open access can contribute towards fixing that. It's also worth saying that if specific scientific subdisciplines do push ahead with open access, the invisibility of the humanities increasingly comes to the fore as a problem in a time of funding crisis. This is changing among researchers, actually. I heard an art historian say the, just the other day, uh, we're worried. What do we do about the inclusion of third party copyright material in our green open access version? If we can't do green open access, we won't be seen if everyone else is doing it. That was the first time I've heard someone make that argument from art history rather than we don't want to do open access. So the message is gradually changing. <clears throat> Lastly, as I mentioned before, the system of copyright is not necessarily serving us well, even if most researchers don't realize it. At the moment, we pay an additional time for material. If we wish to reprographically reproduce material, I'm talking to a bunch of librarians, I suspect many of you know this, we pay additionally licenses to the Copyright Clearance Center, even when the work was written by our colleagues at the institution down the road. Secondly, computational methodologies for analysis of academic corpuses rely on the inherent creation of derivatives for distant reading techniques. In some in some jurisdictions, this is problematic. We had to pass new legislation in the UK last year so that the right to read material was also the right to text and data mine it. In some jurisdictions, there isn't yet legislation that will allow you to do that. In the US, you might be okay because of uh, various fair use cases and transformative use cases as well. But certainly, it's a problem we should think about in an international context. And open licensing in advance might help us to mitigate that international challenge. We know also, if we're thinking about the broader populace as well, that Wikipedia is the first space to which many people have recourse if they need to quickly know something about a topic. That could be a very bad thing if you're not a great fan of Wikipedia's quality control mechanisms. But we also know that it is a space that people value. And we could work to bring the quality of that resource up. But at the moment, the armies of volunteers who edit Wikipedia neither have access to humanities scholarship nor permission to reuse larger portions of it with accreditation wholesale. 
This is good for academics as well if we can foster this type of work. Um, being cited in Wikipedia is that I think the number five click-through source through Crossref. So if you want to be read, get cited in Wikipedia is the message that academics can be given here. But also there's a broader societal remit there. And lastly, for many years, uh, there's been a discourse of post-coloniality in many spaces of the humanities, thinking about the legacies of the British Empire in particular. I'm well placed to speak about this, obviously. Um, and the problems of English language dominance, in particular in the language space. Open licensing lets us think about the ways in which we might allow people to translate work and foster cross-cultural communication, not simply on a commercial basis. Now, this could be of huge benefit. We need to work out ways in which we vet bad translations, get around the issues that have been raised there um, in most recent days by Sandy Thatcher. But nonetheless, if we really value post-coloniality, cross-cultural dialogue, surely working to dismantle the hegemony of English language discourse, the North as a global exporter of knowledge to the global South, uh, community translation could be one way to think about that. Open access is in part the solution to these challenges. And we reached a tipping point, certainly in the UK and the EU in 2013, when a range of funders passed strong mandates for green open access. As I said before, it doesn't cause subscription cancellations. So even governments that have a center rights market orientation and want their publishers to thrive can happily mandate green open access. But green open access relies on the hyperinflationary price increases borne by the library to continue. Gold open access is a better fix, and this is in part where we start to see a proliferation of library publishing enterprises. But there are extreme financial challenges to this, both for the library and for the ways in which many commercial and university press publishers are choosing to implement it. Article processing charges, where publishing is conceived of as a service to authors, causes two distinct problems for the humanities disciplines. The first refers to disciplinary specifics of funding cultures, the second is about cost concentration for institutions. Most work in the humanities disciplines is unfunded beyond institutional time. We don't need enormous labs. We need time. We need research materials, maybe an archive, some travel. But this makes it far harder to bundle in a few thousand dollars so that we can publish articles in a gold open access way. Certainly, I would be laughed out the room if I tried to ask for a $16,000 um, sum from my dean to publish a book with Palgrave, for example. The other problem, though, is that the subscription model does some, one thing very well, which is that it spreads costs across a large number of institutions. If you pay a subscription for $800, you are certainly not paying the full price that it costs for the labor of publishing that work. What the publisher is relying on is that many institutions will all pay that amount and centrally they will have enough funds to conduct their operation. But we also know because of the proliferation of research outputs and the hyperinflationary cost increases that the subscription model causes the access gap. What article processing charges do instead is say at each institution upon acceptance you must pay the full amount that it costs us and any surplus or profit that we need to conduct the publication of that article. And that's problematic for institutions across the spectrum. It's problematic for research intensive institutions because they end up paying many hundreds times more than they did under the subscription mode. <clears throat> it's problematic for institutions who wish to become research intensive because they need to build vast capital reserves if they are, their researchers are going to be able to publish. And it's potentially problematic for small less research intensive institutions who feel shut out from contributing economically to the system of scholarly communications from which they profit and therefore will be denied a voice in the future evolution of that conversation. <clears throat> we also have a unique situation in the humanities, almost unique, where the monograph is valued as the unit of accreditation um, the gold standard for accreditation. Monographs are almost universally acknowledged as different to journal articles by funder mandates. The Wellcome Trust is the exception, a biomedical funder in the UK. They will, it seems, stump up however much money a press wants for a book to be open access. But EU mandates, key mandates in the UK, have all so far said this applies to journal articles, 
not monographs, not book chapters. And the reasons for those are both cultural and economic. It's clear that the costs of producing a book are quantitatively higher than producing a journal article. There's obviously more labor in proofreading an 80,000 word volume than there is in an 8,000 word article. But there's also a social and market phenomenon at work here. There are higher barriers for entry for new publishers, and that's because academics need that symbolic return again. If you start a new journal publishing enterprise, whether it's a library or an independent scholar, it's possible to solicit initial um, articles. Academics have spare articles often that are sitting around just waiting for those finishing touches, but very few academics have a second book in their drawer that they can give you. It's far harder to get off the ground and get the reputation needed in that space. Likewise, although the Public Knowledge Project has its excellent open monograph press now available, that is a relatively young platform compared to open journal systems that many libraries use for their publishing enterprises. Likewise, the production tool chain is certainly in its infancy. If you want to conduct XML typesetting, at present you're almost certainly going to have to pay for a commercial tool like XStyles and have labor available to manually semantically tag each entity within that document. This is labor intensive and it's commercial software that cannot be readily obtained by smaller uh, bootstrap style entities. And lastly, thinking about social aspects, there are different discoverability and value conferral sites for the monograph. And that's just a very complicated humanities way of saying print in bookshops is really important still. And the trade crossover book is, in many ways, the holy grail for disciplines such as history. A popular historian will get their maximum audience and best uh, hope for public engagement by having their TV show, their radio tie-in, and then their book appearing in Barnes & Noble. That's not necessarily incompatible with an open access version, but it does indicate the challenges in this space, particularly if the author expects royalties and advance, um, if the author expects there to be a print copy published with a trade publisher who will be less attuned to the, the desires in the academy to implement open access. In other words, it's a more complex social and economic environment for monographs. Textbooks, on which there's a panel coming up shortly, open textbooks, is a different space entirely with different economics underpinning it. I'm not going to talk about that here. Okay, great. So how did we get here? What might we do to start addressing these problems? There are three core areas where we see challenges. And the first is prestige and a conservative climate. I don't necessarily use these pejoratively, but rather to say that academic behavior is self-reinforcing. The need to publish in ex with existing publishers who hold the symbolic capital you need to get a job means that we are often beholden on those entities to create transition to an open access model. But those entities grew up in an age of print and subscription. They have large staff bases and they face an extreme challenge in the transition to open access. It's risky for big publishers to change their business models when many people's livelihoods depend upon their revenue streams. We also see though a very strange paradoxical formulation where I've talked about the big publishers who are making an enormous amount of profit while at the same time, we have university presses who are struggling even to meet sustainability quotas. How can it be that we've developed such a dichotomy between these and we see university presses in crisis and going under? How do we balance the desire for sustainability against library budgets for knowledge problematically situated? And the last thing I'll say is that learned societies in particular pose a huge challenge for a transition to open access. And this kind of ties across all three of these areas. Learned societies often derive revenue from publishing operations. They outsourced their journals around the 1960s for the most part when they decided it was a too technologically orientated enterprise and that publishers would be better placed to handle this than societies in-house. But if learned societies are making hundreds of thousands of dollars to subsidize their interdisciplinary activities through the publishing market space and they cannot see how an open access model can provide that same return, they will be reluctant to transition and they will dig their heels in, as they are in the UK at the moment. I'm not sure exactly what the solution is to that at the present, but it strikes me that the problem is one of disaggregation of budgets. How is it we think the most efficient way for activities within disciplines in the university to be paid for is for the library budget for knowledge to be paying over the odds so that publishers can make money so that it can be given back to the university? That's certainly not an efficient loop. 
but changing it will take 10 to 20 years. Academic social practice is glacial in its changes. And so I list three uh, elements of a solution that will be familiar to anyone who has undertaken a library publishing enterprise. How do we gain prestige? How do we uh, get academics to submit high quality work to us, get reviewers of a good caliber to give us uh, lengthy and coherent reader reports in a timely manner? How do we provide that same function of brand accreditation that academics want when they submit? At the same time, how do we operate on our budgets? Libraries are not terribly well resourced in many senses because their budgets are going on serials, whether that's in sciences or elsewhere. And how do we balance the need to make a surplus or profit against the need to save the library budget and fulfill the mission of academic libraries? Libraries as publishers is one obvious solution to the open access dilemma and the solution of scholarly communications. I heard someone the other day say, we don't need any more new presses. We've got enough university presses, we need fewer. But actually, the logic runs the other way. Surely, if each institution's mission is to disseminate its research work in a digital age, shouldn't we have a publishing entity at every single institution? That was my devil's advocate response. It didn't go down very well with the historian in particular who'd raised this, but I think that's a more logical outcome. Libraries are great as publishers because they have a global network of peer reviewers. They are centered within institutions. They have a reservoir of ta academic talent at their immediate disposal. Sometimes they have a high degree of technological expertise. Many digital preservation systems like LOCKS were born within library cultures. And people who have been thinking about metadata standards, cataloging, and preservation are often librarians who have faced the devastating consequences when these aspects are not correctly implemented. Likewise, the initial resourcing of library publishing enterprises seems easy. We can get open journal systems, we can put it on one of the servers in the library, and we can provide academics with the support to conduct the editorial processes. Libraries as publishers, the good. Libraries as publishers, the not so good or the bad. Prestige versus the university press is a challenge here. Library publishing enterprises often find themselves situated by management as the poor relation cousins of the university press. And this has come about through an evolution in how often institutions think of their university presses. Why do institutions want university presses is a question that's worth asking. And I say there are probably two reasons. The first is, in some cases, they want an entity that will provide economic return to their institution. The larger university presses are more like commercial publishers. Cambridge, Oxford, and Harvard University Press return money as independently operating branches of their universities to institutions that, quite frankly, are already very wealthy. Secondly, universities want prestigious university presses because it acts as a student recruitment trigger. If, the majority of high, if a substantial volume of high quality research material that potential students might encounter has been published by the university press as an institution is the most efficient form of advertising for recruitment that you can see. By contrast, a library publishing enterprise faces the definite stigma of not being called a university press, even though the function is near identical. There are often different economic expectations. Library publishing enterprises often request budgetary funds from management rather than being the entity that they want to return it although that may change as we come under pressure. I do want to ask what the difference is between a university press and a library publisher, though. And I think, fundamentally, it is a historical lineage in the changing function of the library. As we move from connect collecting to connecting, as many recent events have put it, the library has found itself slightly wrong-footed with respect to the future. There's definitely an anxiety. What is the library space if it's no longer home to a physical collection? And one of the obvious answers is, well, we not only help researchers find material, we not only help with information literacy and preservation and cataloging, etc., but we also help them to disseminate their work. University presses traditionally fitted only in the dissemination aspect of that. And so the library enterprise looks like a murky halfway space there to many. Secondly, I mentioned that libraries often have great technological expertise, but that is not universally the case. 
I do think that the librarian of the future will be a technologist. But at the current moment, we're in a half world between those spaces where some libraries are extremely well resourced in technical terms and others are not. And this can lead to challenges. Library publishing enterprises have sometimes folded and they haven't sometimes been adequately digitally preserved. In those instances, library publishing gets a bad reputation as that journal died after three years. Library publishing has to take seriously professionalization. I'm sure many of the enterprises we'll hear about today do so, but that needs to be universally extended. And means of cooperating might help us to spread technological expertise and resources across institutions. Lastly, the long-term resourcing and staffing of library publishing enterprises is often not considered by management at institutions. If you can get off the ground quickly, why can't you run it forever quickly, is the question that's posed. We all know, though, that the daily slog of maintaining software, of updating it, of ensuring systems are patched, is not simply a one-time uh, put it up and forget about it, but an ongoing engagement that we need. Finding out models that can support library publishing that also support open access are a challenge that we're still at an experimental phase of reckoning with. And lastly, the ugly. What does it mean for us to cooperate in an age of institutional competition, not invented here, and income from student recruitment? A quick anecdote. I was at a library event in the UK where a group of libraries in the north of England had got together and wanted to cooperate. That was their phrase. We want to work out what it is we can do together. And we sat around a table for six hours. And at the end of the six hours, we were no closer to having a single definite project on which these institutions could cooperate without management telling them that they needed a unique selling point, a unique advantage over the other libraries around the table. Abstract desires by individuals to work together in institutions is great and to be encouraged, but it's not enough to broach the fact that institutions rely on revenue from student recruitment and that symbolic economy of prestige functions once more. Consortial organizations like the LPC are brilliant in bringing together enterprises, but what does it mean to really share technological services? What does it mean to have different universities' brands in the same space when the pressure from management is to ensure that brand is preserved, try and get a press release out of Harvard for their participation in your initiative, and you'll know they're very protective of that phenomenon. So working out what cooperation actually looks like is very difficult from within library publishing spaces. And it's my contention that we need various glue layers to make this work. And what I mean by that is getting away from university brand in some cases. The LPC, again, is a great example of that. It's not... Uh, Portland State LPC here, where it's not a specific university's library publishing coalition. It is genuinely an independent organization, politically neutral in those senses. And how do we find political neutrality from within institutions? We create new structures from outside. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing, obviously. Our initiative is called the Open Library of Humanities, and we have initial funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation this year, for which we're extremely grateful. We are a mega-journal, multi-journal, not-for-profit, collectively funded enterprise. And if you've got all that, that's great. We can stop. Say a bit more. Our mission is to implement a mode of gold open access journal publishing predominantly in the humanities without article processing charges, working with a large number of libraries and library publishing enterprises where appropriate. And a little bit of the history of this project. We had many conversations at the beginning with a range of academics and figures as to what this should look like. And we spent a long time putting committees together. We have figures like Peter Suber from Harvard, well known in the open access space. Michael Eisen from PLOS in the sciences. Uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick from the MLA, Margie Avery, who was then at MIT Press, um, librarians from around the UK and the US, an early career researcher forum, an internationalization forum. And we essentially asked, what would it look like to make this work? Where would you as researchers publish? What would you as librarians support? What have you as existing publishers already learned? And I think getting cross-stakeholder involvement in projects, even library publishing projects on a small scale, 
is important to work out what your challenges are. Because often when you come up with an idea, you've got a plan, but you can't see what barriers you're going to hit and what responses you didn't know. It's those unknown unknowns, as a recent politician might have put it. And the topology that we designed for this project consists of two discrete but interlinked components. The first is a trans-humanities mega journal called the Open Library of Humanities. This is a double-blind peer-reviewed space, so it's not a mega journal in the sense of PLOS One's peer review light. It is a space where any researcher who, who identifies their practice as falling within the humanities disciplines can submit. And we will review that work through a network of section editors and publish it. And that is for people who are sold on the idea of open access, are sold on the idea that journal brand, as it has traditionally functioned, is a damaging phenomenon, that journals are actually a print legacy function that we implement in the digital space because we need to integrate with the existing social environment. Journal of X studies and Journal of Y studies in this diagram is, though, where I think this gets interesting and where we start to talk about library publishing partners. It's possible under our model for existing journals to come on board our model and share our, our economic business plan. So at launch, we currently have five journals scheduled to come on board, and these span three different categories. The first are subscription journals. When academics are running their own journals and have control of an editorial board, we welcome them to leave their existing publishers and come join our open access platform instead. There will be no article processing charges. They can maintain their existing brand, their own editorial processes, etc. We will simply undertake the labor of a publisher that underwrites their activities. And that's great, because that's actually a transition. That's where you can see savings to a library when they can cancel a subscription and move to funding new modes of open access. That's exciting for me. The second type of journal that we welcome are those driven by article processing charge models. In fact, a recent publisher, a small publisher in the UK, uh, is deciding to move away from journal publishing because the managing director can't see how article processing charges can work in that space. Their subscription at the moment, they'd have to do APCs, but that's not going to work. Those journals are speaking with us about maybe coming on board our model. And lastly, and perhaps most relevantly for the audience here today, where library publishing enterprises have started their own journals and can no longer sustain them, or where individual scholars at institutions have come to a library and said, can you help us? We can't maintain this publication anymore, or we're not preserved, or we're not professionalized. We can take those journals on board and ensure they are maintained while giving full editorial independence to those boards as they were before. In other words, in that case, this can be a rescue operation for those valued communities who haven't quite worked out the sustainability on their own fronts. We have a good crop of initial articles pledged to us, over 100, and they're going through submission and review at the moment for the mega journal. And as I said, five journals coming on board. Great. What's the funding unicorn that makes it work? What's the magic where you can do this on a sustainable basis without article processing charges? The current system of funding uh, research publication looks a little bit like this, where those signs are not restrooms, they are libraries. I have used that joke at other talks, I'm sorry to say. It's not unique to this event. So thank you to those who saw parts of this talk before and laughed anyway. That was really appreciated. Um, we have a large number of libraries, all paying relatively large sums so that classical economic theory can work out and people can be kept out of this system. The classic economic model is one where people will only pay for goods if the goods are exclusive to them. In other words, I'm not going to pay for something that everyone else benefits from because I don't like the free riders. But that's not what university libraries necessarily look like in terms of their economics. An interlibrary loan is the real bubble-bursting point here. If my library has bought a copy of a book and the library down the road or even across the country wants a copy, we will post it to them if they will pay the postage on our behalf. So in that sense, there were free riders always throughout the model of classic library into library loan systems. If you don't pay for work, you can still get it, no matter how inconvenient it is. And we propose, like several other models like Knowledge Unlatched, Archive, and to an extent Scope 3, to build a cost pool and invert the classic model here. So instead of many libraries all paying so that others can be excluded from access, we're putting together a consortium of libraries who all pay into a cost pool 
so that we can remunerate the labor and capital of publishing on a not-for-profit basis and make the work open access. And this works out to be extremely efficient. And I'll show you some dull spreadsheets in a minute. I can see all the eyes lighting up as I say that. Libraries who participate are given a governance stake in our project. And this is why it's more of a glue layer and having a say than just another publishing enterprise. When a journal comes to us, there are two stages of vetting. The academic boards have to say, this was of high enough quality, we want it. And the library boards between them have to say, this is something to which we would subscribe. We are willing to raise our costs between us by enough to cover the costs of this publication year on year. And in that way, libraries play a role in transition. Because if you don't have the budget, it's not right for us to ask you to pay for open access on top of that. It has to actually be something that moves ahead. And what do the economics look like? It's worth saying we do also have a university press publishing partnership in the future if enough libraries participate. But by our current models, if 350 libraries participate at $1,000, we could publish 250 articles and 12 books open access. $1,000 is less than the cost of a single subscription for some journals, and even in the humanities. It's certainly less than an article single article processing charge. And what happens when you take the books out of that model? Well, it gets even better. Uh, by the way, in this setup, Journal A is a commercial publisher of an American studies journal. Journal B is a university press publisher of an American studies journal. And I draw your attention even to the fact there, though, that university presses are far kinder to library budgets than their commercial counterparts. A $10 per article difference we found from just one uh, instance here. But nonetheless, when we pool our costs, it looks extremely efficient. With 400 libraries, we could publish 250 articles with them each paying $462. And the cost per article per institution is just $1.84. That's a slightly unfair comparison because obviously everyone is paying like a subscription in so that we have the funds centrally. But it does give you an idea of how the model starts to scale. We work with lyricists in North America and we opened at the end of January for contributions. Since then, over 60 libraries have already signed up to the program, which was great and terrifying and excellent all in the same moment. We're not a shareholding organization and we call ourselves a library, which was a very deliberate brand choice. We are, of course, actually a publisher. But libraries are publishers in the future, and so are we. We're led by academics, and we're not for profit. And we accept no venture capital funding, so there is no exit strategy where we get sold to Elsevier, which is good. We have a banding system for those institutions who are interested, and I'm not here just to do a sales pitch, so I'm not going to talk about this for too long. But my point is that we're not a library publishing enterprise in the strict sense of being library librarians from inside an institution. What we've done instead is that we're a library publishing enterprise in the sense of libraries' economic power coming together to do more than any single library could do if it were bearing the costs itself. And so the challenge that I want to close with today for library publishing enterprises is to think through what cooperation between you looks like. If you're under institutional pressure to compete, how do you find ways of sharing infrastructure, sharing missions, and sharing goals? Is it possible? Or is it through your financial contributions to other glue layers, like ours, like Knowledge Unlatched, like other projects that can socially pool resources that you can work together? What are the pragmatic transition strategies by which libraries facilitate inter-institutional cooperation and a path to open access in all disciplines so that we achieve the mission of libraries to provide universal access to scholarship. Thank you very much.